So actually, recording the Zoom call and then you can start recording. It's already started. It's recording. Yeah, it's recording. Great. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Leaders, our first <laughs> session with uh, Mutu. Thank you, Mutu, for thanks, thanks, thanks. accepting our invitation to come to the IIT AIS Club. Uh, we're really uh, excited to have you here. Lovely to be here. And nice, to, nice to meet all of you. Great. Uh, so, I'm going to get straight into it, right? So when we, when we spoke about this event, uh, we had said, look, we'll, we'll get a little bit into the what's really happening for you. Make it a more intimate conversation. Right? This has really become an intimate conversation. Um, probably I'll start with... Uh, check, check. Should we use the mic? Yeah. Okay, great. So probably I'll start with you. Uh, and if you can just tell us a few highlights of your life. Okay, sure. So um, I think a uh, couple of highlights. I sort of start with some of the, the more uh, uh, more professional ones, and I guess then move to uh, more of the personal ones. So I think on the uh, I started my career working for an FMCG company. The company is uh, Kevin Care. They are uh, Chennai based in Australia, and I was in their sales organization for almost three years. So sort of managed sales for them in uh, Maharashtra, Chhattisgarh, uh, Madhya Pradesh, and in Madhya Pradesh. So that was a fantastic experience. I think it was completely out of the comfort zone. So I think that's uh, that's one. Um, I'll be adding Paddy, and we'll talk more about Paddy later, but I uh, used to run the nutraceutical business for four odd years. Uh, so that was my first uh, line responsibility. So very uh, defining role, I would say we had some successes, but I think the setbacks and challenges that we had uh, for, uh, for much more than the successes, so I think that was uh, really good from a learning and character building. Third uh, was uh, about a year and a half ago, I was invited to join the board of directors of uh, Mind Run and So, um, well, uh, it was an honor, of course. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience, but you know, it was that fanboy moment. You know, when you hear cricketers say that uh, they were honored to play with Sachin or to play with Tony, when they interviewed on TV, uh, you know, Mr. Anand Mahindra, someone I admired uh, growing up, uh, and you know, when I understood business and started to follow business. So it was a real fanboy moment to, you know, sit with him and his very eminent board and management team on the same table. And it's been a fantastic experience. So if I was to move over to the personal front, so actually my wife is here as well. And you know, we were in um, Rishikesh about four or five years ago, actually a little really longer than that. We by chance uh, attended a, a Vedanta session. You know, and uh, and you know, we uh, went, went to a couple of sessions. We were there for a couple of days and uh, we got quite interested. And uh, so perhaps that philosophical leading and you know, bringing some of those learnings into the we, we sort of go about our lives and, and do our work uh, has been quite uh, quite defining. Um, the last one is uh, our son Krishna was born a year and a half ago. So I think a uh, very, very uh, joyful experience there. I think he's only one and a half, so it's the fun period. Most people have said it gets uh, quite, uh, you know, quite tricky after that and quite a pain, but I think they're enjoying this period as it does. So these are some of the, yeah. I guess, yeah. I can watch for every period we both a pleasure and a pain. And I think there are people here who have kids one even older. So <laughs> I think there's a so it's a good balance, keeps you honest. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting to hear about the Vedanta side of it. And maybe we'll come back when we talk about the business and you know how you've integrated that part into your into your life. You know? But one one question you're one of the you're from one of the most industrious business families in South India. What's it like to be part of the, the broader Mudapa family and carry the brand? No, so you know, definitely, uh, definitely an honor. I guess we were grown up part of it and uh, sort of uh, embodied all the, uh, the beliefs and sort of core set of values. Um, and I think their family per se, just in the way they, uh, you know, engage with society and, and progress the things of the path, and largely have had uh, a good reputation and sort of largely still. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, try our best not to uh, not to change much of that, but you know. Uh, carry on the progress that's uh, been made 
and uh, also you know uh, try and stay relevant uh, to the times while we do that, keeping the whole value system in mind. So that's really uh, what I see for myself, and perhaps what some of the others in the family uh, see for themselves is really uh, uh, we're just custodians to this heritage, and uh, I guess we're just really trustees uh, of uh, of this responsibility. That's a that's a very wise. I mean, it's it's one of the things that, from my own perspective, right? I serve in my role as a consultant. I serve corporates and I serve companies like yours, where there's a the owner and, and multi generational owner. It's a very interesting one with the legacy that you're both taking on and the legacy you're going to leave behind for future generations, right? Um, and at, at any point, do you kind of not worry, but do you think about that? Like, what is the legacy? Taking over the, does that kind of, what's the weight of that like? Is it a big weight? Is that, how, do you, how do you deal with that? No, I mean, we're not, uh, we don't you know, think about it all the time. I, I guess you, uh, I guess you've grown up around uh, you know, a certain ethos and a certain way of doing things. I think it's important to, uh, as I said, keep that value system that's the core and, and kind of keep uh, progressing, uh, progressing forward, right? Because, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders, the family and the business touches, and I think uh, and we have to keep, uh, keep sort of cycling forward so that you know all of them we make make sort of right impact on all of them. You mentioned your uh, career journey. Now you're looking at EIT Paris and you're deeply in there. Tell us a little bit about your role right now. You said you you headed you visited this before. What are you doing right now? Almost what are you most excited about in the last 12, 18 months or what EIT Paris? So, so um, my role right now is the head of uh, strategy for the for the company, and I think as the head of strategy, really focused on uh, on the sort of growth and uh, and transformation. Uh, but perhaps you know maybe uh, let's take a step back and talk about EIT Paris you know, itself. So uh, very old company, it's almost 150 years old. So I think one of the oldest in town. EIT stands for East India Distillery, so it's part of the British. Uh, East India Company of the 1800s when they came to India. So we never started uh, this business. Uh, in the early 80s, it was our venture from a former president of the country and then finance minister actually came up to the family and said, you know, uh, encouraged us to take on the business. It was a sick, uh, sick unit. Uh, so we took it on and like a transformation ensued uh, over the next two or three decades. It had businesses, we talked about Paris Street, so, you know, we don't carry sweets in our pocket anymore. I think that <laughs> the business got divested. I guess uh, the supply of sweets, uh, you know, really in, in the houses. Um, and it had the ferry where sanitary where it had an agri and foods business, which is now Coromandel. And that's a very uh, successful and leading agri and foods company in India. Um, so a lot of uh, changes over time, but with a nice transformation. So I think. Uh, I would say 2005 to 2010, you know, the first decade of the Millennium Parry took on a mandate to really enter very deeply into the uh, sugar industry uh, and sort of deepen its presence in the South. And I think what was envisaged was to really be the uh, industry leader in the South. So I think uh, with that in mind, you know, a massive expansion program was embarked upon. I think what ensued in the decade 2010 to 2020 was all the assumptions were, uh, were proven wrong. So around uh, you know, government policy was very, uh, I guess, anti the sugar industry, obviously very pro farmer. Uh, climate change, uh, you know, a lot of failed monsoons, the failure of the sugarcane crop in Tamil Nadu. So a lot of setbacks. So I think that you know massive uh, uh, expansion program unfortunately fell uh, fell quite flat. Uh, so I think after a little bit of introspection towards the end of that decade, which is you know 2017, 18, company realized we had to. Really scale back, and I think then started a program of cost reduction, of course, making operations more efficient, but also you know, divesting, divesting you know, businesses, uh, taking out MPAs, closing plants, uh, bringing leverage down. So very, very tricky uh, way of doing it. So it was around the time I also sort of moved on from the pharmaceuticals uh, business and uh, joined the company. So I'm just sort of linking it back to your question around what where we are now. So I think much better position now, uh, financially as well. And that conversation around growth and transformation has, uh, has started the last one year. So that's the one I'm leading and I'm really looking ahead. Uh, we don't want to be too wedded into uh, 
uh, the sugar industry, which is you know dependent very much on government policy and regulation and climate change. Um, I think our uh, our intent is to uh, move away from that. We can't move away from the industry, but move away from that. I think the uh, biofuels program, where we make a lot of bioethanol as a byproduct, that's become now one of the key business verticals. So I think the biofuels vertical. Uh, uh, will be you know key area of focus going forward. Um, the second one is the sweetener retail. We retail a lot of the sweeteners that we make, sugar, jaggery, uh, low GI sugar, and you will see a lot of new launches being a Chennai-based company. All the new launches come to the Chennai market first, and so all of your stores will have uh, you know the entire gamut of products. Uh, and with that business, our vision is to sweeten in India. I don't we don't believe that there is a category leader in India. Uh, the sweetener category is only uh, eight percent branded. Uh, if you look at salt, it's uh, an almost ninety-five percent branded, largely by one player, which is Tata. Um, so that's our vision. I mean, if uh, you know, uh, Tata stands for salt, and Cadbury stands for chocolate, and uh, Paris stands for hair oil. We want Paris over the next decade to be synonymous with sweetening in India. So it's a very uh, large uh, vision that we have. Uh, and the third vertical, which is an area of focus, is the food and nutritional ingredients. So we are in the pharmaceutical space, and we're now just on a bit of a journey of internal reflection to see how we can have a larger play. We haven't written up that plan as of yet, but this is really the third uh, number. Amazing. And if I can just follow up on the three, the sweetening India is such a bold, bold proposition. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's a very bold plan. And we hear from a Chennai company. To have an India ambition vision is, at least for me, it's very, very exciting. But it must be a transition, right? Because you talked about how this has been a sugar company and the pharma back factory. Now you're going factory forward with the consumer. How, how is that transition? Because you're a company that's very good, you've got such a long history, about 150 years, right? Just nearly 150 years. Oh, yeah. Uh, as I said, the company is very old. So how, how is that? How is that transition going? So you know, you, you said closer to the consumer. I would first say closer to the customer, right? Because uh, you know, on the commodity side, when you're making that transition, so I think uh, on the commodity side, the focus is very supply chain led. It's very plant and factory led. And once your product is closed, it's uh, commodity economics, which then determines how uh, how well or how badly you do. So as we want to move away uh, from the uncontrollables, as I was sort of describing. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of customer centricity and customer engagement which we need to focus on. And then you've got this emphasis on quality, product development, science, moving your you know, uh, relationships with customers and with the market from a mere transactional one to a more partnership where you're actually co evolving uh, solutions with them. Uh, that's a big change. And I think it's, it's happening bit by bit, and I think we're doing it across levels in the organization. But uh, I think what we've learned, and uh, perhaps you would all also know from your organizations, it also has to be top driven. So, right from the board to the you know, senior leadership team, uh, I think this uh, sort of transformation and shift in the company's thinking, we're, we're working on that very consciously and kind of doing a lot of consensus to do that. Right. And if you can, without necessarily breaking it, Confidentiality or not. Some you know, learnings for yourself, right? Because you're navigating this as you go. And if you look back, anything you wish you had known now when, that you're not there that you know now when yeah. you started? No, I mean, I, I, I kind of knew this, this would, be, would be challenging, I guess, you know, in any transformation. Um, and we were, uh, we were actually having a little chat about something uh, earlier, earlier today in terms of some investments to make in, in, this, uh, in this space. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, it seems very logical when you uh, when you're thinking customer and you're thinking consumer, but uh, perhaps the the team and the core team is not geared towards that. So I mean, I, I guess you, we knew that it would be it would be challenging, but yeah, I guess patience is one uh, one virtue that uh, that's the it's a big learning. You've got to be patient around it because you, you know you can't um, stretch the whole organization too much, stretch it other than too much, it breaks. So it's pretty simple. So I think that's the biggest learning to be patient and perhaps stretch the organization to an optimal level um, so that some of this change is uh, achieved. Yes. And if you look out like five, ten years, right, well, as you said, you're really starting. Uh, many people call this India's decade. So what would make this Paris decade? So imagine you're in 2030 and you say, absolutely, 
got this right. Over yeah, time. yeah. So there's always all of these financial metrics and market share and growth metrics that we have. So uh, uh, you know, we've uh, we've set them out. Some of them are two x, and some of them are three x. Some of them are eight x. Um, so we don't bother too much. So you know, we, um, you want to be you know, talk about how the, the Vedanta principles that we learned uh, linked it to to business, right? So you know. Uh, the philosophy focuses a lot on okay, there is a there is an end result, but you know, focus on the steps in the process and uh, try and enjoy the journey. So I think that's what we're doing. We've got a broader, uh, broader kind of a vision. Uh, we're not too uh, worried about that five x or six x. I think uh, everyone, and at least me personally, is trying to end up, enjoy the journey of uh, getting there. Right. So yeah. So one last question on Paris before we move to broader topics. What keeps you up at night? Other than Krishna. <laughs> he actually he, he, he sleeps a little late, but he sleeps through the night, which is uh, which is quite ideal actually. But you know, I I wouldn't say any of these objectives or the, what we've set out for ourselves keeps me up. I would say, um, and again, the philosophy teaches you not to worry about the uncontrollables. But uh, you know, you can't uh, not a, not I'm not um, someone who's completely transformed yet. <laughs> Uh, I think there are a lot of uncontrollables about climate change. You know, the monsoons might fail. Um, there's a huge dependence on uh, on that. There's a huge dependence on government policy, and government policy is not really designed to support the 200 sugar mills uh, in India. I think it's designed to support the millions of farmers that uh, are the uh, you know also the vote back of the government. If that's right, we so for that. Um, so that's uncertain. So I think for the next five seven years, until you know a lot of the transformation happens and we. Uh, newer sort of avenues or the stronger business models start firing. Um, I think uh, the core uh, business is very important so that uh, the company keeps moving forward and I think we keep also clocking uh, in good results. So that uh, that is a, is a concern that so much is not in your control. Secondly, you know, there's a war on uh, talent and I think we're seeing this across uh, so many sectors. Uh, I think this is certainly going to be India's decade. And uh, there's, uh, there's a lot happening. So there's always people who have a lot of opportunities. And I think even, you know, we talked about this, you're seeing this in the consulting space as well. You know, a lot of well funded startups are perhaps picking up uh, you know, excellent resources, which you guys will have. Uh, I think we're seeing this in, in, in our industry as well. So, yeah, no talent is permanent. So you have to work that extra hard to, you know, keep, uh, keep everyone motivated. Very, very true. Very, very true. Now, if we just look a little broader, but before I ask you the next question, Question for the audience. Do you have any questions? And I'll come back to that. Uh, I can already see some interested people. And I can <laughs> also see some potential regulars in the back <laughs> who may have something to say. Uh, so I'm going to just ask a few, a few more questions and then we'll, we'll open it up a little bit. Right? Just uh, one more, kind of, even looking more broadly. I see you as one of Tamina's current and future leaders. So I'm going to ask you a very broad question, like statesman like this. Yes, yes, in practice. So the, the first one is kind of what do you see? You know, how is Samana going in its business environment? Uh, is it a good place to operate it? Operate it in the last two years. How is it? How is it like? And you can obviously say the good things, if you will. But also, what are the one or two things that probably should be better? So you know, I think Tamil Nadu has always been in a reasonable position. We've never been Mumbai or Pune, uh, and I don't think we've been out of the game or out of the race as well. We've always been somewhere in the middle. We may have fallen back, uh, you know, a little bit then at some points in time, but I think uh, uh, we've got some strengths. Uh, I think, uh, and I think we, if we stick to that, I think we should be good. I think we've got a generally a good society here. There's a good, talented workforce. Uh, I think the private sector in Tamil Nadu, the, the legacy private sector, which has been around in the state, private sector which is coming from other parts of India, and say multinational companies will come in all of um, sort of. I think they appreciate this consistency and this uh, uh, some sort of certainty that the state gives them. So I think that sort of keeps us uh, moving forward. So I think we are in a reasonable place. There seems to be good things uh, happening. And I think Karnanadu is uh, in well positioned. I think there are a lot of advantages. Uh, when you move around uh, other parts of the country and not just the cities, if you really go well beyond and have, have a good portion of uh, just by virtue of the business and visiting factories. Uh, in sort of tracking on the state. I think, yeah, there's a lot more uniform uh, development and activity. You see a lot of other states, they are more city centric. I would come now, I think, doesn't happen. So I think reasonable platform and position for us to propel forward. 
and one or two things the state should be doing further opposition? You know, I think there's a lot more room for investment in the state. There are a lot of things. I think there are some corridors in the state which could, uh, you know, certainly take on more investment. I was talking to someone in the CIA, I'm not part of the CIA, but we were chatting about the whole southern corridor, the three sides, the port, and all of that. So maybe a bit more industrial development. I know that uh, looking at backward districts like Krishna Kini and Tarnapuri. Uh, so, yeah, I think you know, you've got some strengths from manufacturing, so on and so forth, and if we can uh, take those forward, uh, I think that would be good. Okay. And as you kind of think about that, you're also invested in the, the startup world and looking at what's around. And I've come in, coming from back a year ago, I've been pleasantly surprised by how much activity there is, like even in the building where it's like. Search part is uh, is housing many of these. Well, where are you seeing the big themes that we should be kind of doubling down on in the state in the startup world? So you know, I, I would say startup and in in general, uh, you know, I I think we're strong on manufacturing as we're seeing. I think uh, new mobility and electric uh, electric mobility. We're already seeing a lot of activity, and I think we should certainly double down. There is a uh, you know manufacturing legacy in the state. And I think that coupled with the, the fact that there is, uh, you know, you've got your Bangalore Chennai, I don't know if it's a formal corridor or not, but you've know, got Bangalore, you've got Chennai, they are fairly close to each other. And with the new mobility also having a you know, tech being sort of playing a large role in new mobility, I think this, uh, uh, you know, this confluence can be quite magical. Uh, and I think the state should, uh, should leverage that. So I think that's one sector. Healthcare has always been prominent here. I think you have. Some industry leaders have a lot more new ones also uh, developing, so I think there will be a lot of action there. Um, apart from that, I think the SaaS ecosystem, uh, I think obviously Tamil Nadu, Chennai is the capital, it's a SaaS capital. They've got the SaaS Bumi and everything there. You've got uh, the marquee companies like Zoho and Freshworks and, and more have been minted. So uh, I think SaaS and uh, FinTech, there's a good ecosystem uh, that is also growing here. Now, last year, I had some notes here which, uh, which I will refer to. There, we talked about the IIT ecosystem, right? So, deep tech, AI, space tech, a lot of that action is getting spawned around uh, this campus and, and right next door. Uh, so, these are probably the areas, but you know, I was reflecting upon this, but you know, uh, there's a saying, uh, you know, uh, do, do something which is close to your knitting. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess the meaning of that is do something you're familiar with, but I think um, in this case, uh, there's an inherent, uh, uh, inherent nature and inherent in the city and in Tamil Nadu. So I'm going back to the philosophy. Philosophy talks about vasanas. Vasanas are ones in, uh, you know, inherent human natures. So perhaps if Tamil Nadu and Chennai stick to their inherent nature on some of these industries and then go deep, uh, I think that would be very uh, meaningful growth. I don't see Tamil Nadu or Chennai doing a crypto or doing e-commerce or social commerce or doing a dream eleven or gaming. Uh, perhaps some of the industries that I uh, was talking about, at least in my reflection, uh, are closer to the knitting here. And I think going deep will be quite painful for us. Very, very wise words. Now, let me open it up a little bit to our, our audience. Uh, and if you have any questions, happy to moderate. Any of the topics we covered, but anything else as well. I've asked a tech question on high
So, uh, I, you know, I don't believe too many people um, are, if they're adding capacity now, you're perhaps like they want to be part of the ethanol uh, pool, which, uh, which, is, which is currently ongoing. And we believe, by the way, ethanol is a medium term opportunity, it's not a long term opportunity. I think there will be a, a fairly elaborate scale up, at least in two and three years on, uh, on EV. Uh, so, I think ethanol will be a medium term opportunity. And, uh, you know, Companies who get in at the right time, the right time is perhaps around now and next year, who are, have all of their uh, decks in place, uh, should do well and should certainly recover their investments. I think once ethanol starts to wean, uh, I think it's going to be challenging. I mean, people will need to have uh, these different business models after that, different applications with all the alcohol that they're making. Or you have to bring the drinking age in India down by two years. And you might uh, you might be able to make them more alcohol, uh, but I don't see that happening. Um, I don't see too many people uh, adding sugar capacity. Certainly not in Tamil Nadu. In Karnataka, which is a large uh, presence for us in a large state, uh, we have seen a little bit of capacity addition. It's uh, more to do with the ethanol program. But I mean, let me uh, let me also be frank and honest here. Yeah, it is a and we've obviously served in this industry. It's convenient for um, you know entrepreneurs to um, you know to make money in, in some way or the other with this business model. Now, if you take Karnataka, this most of the mills are government or quasi government controlled and the mills of production. Um, there are two private mills there. There's Renuka, which is now owned by Bilmar, and there's us. So we pay the farmers in 15 days. That's our philosophy. Renuka pays them in 30 days. The other guys pay them in nine months. So we still want them to vote for them. There's informal ways of making money in the nature of which the sugar industry and the, and the plant is set up. And that's perhaps convenient for people. It's smart for people to have a strict corporate government structure to go down that path. So I don't certainly see us adding too much capacity. We've uh, you know, we moved, uh, we closed three plants in Tamil Nadu and we moved some mills from one of the plants into Karnataka just because we know we have sugar cane available. Uh, but uh, we don't see too many people adding too much. Yeah, I forgot that. That's another thing. Put it down. So, do you still think there will be more players in the side? Um, I think a lot have already fallen. I'm not seeing uh, seen a lot of that. Yeah. So you're largely uh, in Sukhi, Maharashtra, and, and to some extent Karnataka, which are just mostly growing states. There is no sugar cane anywhere else of any you know meaningful sense. That that's what it's become. We are unfortunately dragged down by our presence in Tamil Nadu because the economics, the metrics of you know doing it processing sugar cane in Tamil Nadu isn't great. Karnataka is far far better from a yield and recovery perspective. We compare our Tamil Nadu operations to our Karnataka operations, it's stock and cheese. And Tamil Nadu brings down the overall uh, overall financial pitch. Uh, <coughs> No, no, and I think those those are big drastic interventions. I, you know, I think they haven't been tried. I think the, the one intervention which I think also changed the industry is about five years ago, we got a different variety of sugarcane crop, which was much more higher yielding, and that has resulted in a huge uh, increase in the quantum of sugar that was produced and the quantum of cane that was grown. I think that changed the nature of the, the industry in itself. But where you are currently is, is a reasonable sweet spot. You'll be here for about uh, you know, maybe another year or two. <laughs> it's not permanent. So the yields moved by, I think, 2%. The recovery is moved by 2%. So they are comfortably 11, 11.5% recovery. Right now. So that's a big swing. Yeah. What about beet sugar? Beach sugar is there in Europe. Yeah, Europe is beach sugar. We don't have beach sugar in India, only it's yeah. expensive to grow. Yeah. But I mean, look, uh, right, sugar is a growing commodity. I think we are consumerizing it because obviously there is a premium. I think there's a premium in branded and premium in speciality grade sugars like brown sugar and jaggery because they're more healthy. Uh, and that's the route that we are taking. So more of our sugar will perhaps go that way rather than going into shape. That's uh, that's the intent. Uh, there is a release quota, so you can only sell 
And so that's also government control. <laughs> How much you can say we want the government control? If you can sell it at a better realization, uh, you're better off rather than sell it at trade. So, you know, if you sell it as jaggery, if you sell it as brown sugar, your realization is much higher. It's the same sugar. The normal yeah, white sugar. Yeah. Sugar. And we are seeing that play out. I think, uh, you know, we talked about Paris sweets. Uh, that uh, so Paris, oh, oh, sweets. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, was a, yeah. yeah. So, you know, that was divested uh, you know, 20 years ago. So, it's a whole generation we just skipped any brand recognition. So, people <laughs> who were, you know, born around the time and, you know, kind of in their, uh, entering the working population, now they have no idea about this brand. But perhaps the decision makers in the households, uh, you know, who are in their late 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, we call the brand Paddy. So I think uh, timing is reasonably reasonably right in terms of us, I guess, ramping up on the branding side. Yes, we are seeing uh, that people will, uh, the biggest challenge is to shift from no sugar, which is available in the store in a, in a corner shop or, a, you know, Kirana outlet. Uh, the biggest challenge is to shift someone from no sugar to branded. So, uh, our, um, we have a brand called Clean and White, which is just a 25, uh, 55 say premium, I think, to, uh, to that sugar. So you get people started on the journey there. And then all of the other, there's two further grades of white sugar, that is brown, there's jaggery, uh, there's a low glycemic index sugar. Those are, those are our niche markets. Uh, but that's the sort of trajectory we, we look that people will make that shift. I I don't see that. Yeah, so the uh, low GI, which is the, <laughs> the, 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 it's a new concept. So our intent is to sort of keep it alive and not you know, blow up too much of ad, uh, ad spends and a promo spend on it. Uh, I think the focus for us is distribution and pushing products like jaggery and uh, you know, waves of white sugar, because those are ones which uh, will really help us get our distribution far and wide. These are more niche plays. So you want to talk a little bit about the jaggery product because I don't know if you has seen the jaggery product on the shelves. It's yeah. a great jaggery product. Very jaggery. It's available. Yeah, jaggery for all. There's so many brands. Yeah. No, so you know, in the sweetness space, there is room for a good, or you know, there is room for a strong brand uh, who you know transcends different products. Uh, but yeah, so talk a bit about jaggery. Uh, the way jaggery is made, you know, you know, you know that cover, uh, but. Um, the first crush of sugarcane, sugarcane gets crushed, you know, for, over multiple times in a factory. The first crush, uh, the juice which comes out of there, that's clarified and then uh, made uh, into jaggery. So it's certainly healthier. By the time you get white sugar, a lot of the uh, nutrients are, uh, are taken away. Uh, again, a huge market opportunity. Jaggery is uh, perhaps one third the sweetener market. I mean, our uh, understanding of the sweetener market in India is a lakh and fifty thousand crores. Uh, jaggery is one third of that. Uh, so it's a very large opportunity. At an institutional level, it's, it's sort of one third of that. If you break it up further, if you brand it, then maybe brand it is a, you know, it's a small subset of that. But it's a very large opportunity, and people pay a premium for that. We pay a premium for uh, nutrition value, space. Yeah, yeah, we, we are. So we, uh, uh, we currently have some uh, third party units which manufacture it for us. We are setting up our own plant. Um, so we're not making as much as there is demand right now. So it, it moves fairly fast, and we're not able to place it across the city as well on, on all the shelves. So you know, yeah. So some of the larger supermarkets and all of that they they do have it, uh, but uh, we we will have more. <laughs> more yeah, I'm very quite you agree. Everyone here should be able to buy yeah. Yes, <laughs> should you give me a call otherwise? <laughs> what is the differentiation you have in mind for doing uh, food? So, so, you know, by, uh, from a market share perspective, there's no one really who has a market share because there's no sugar brand. You can't recall a sugar brand. There's Madhur and there's us in the South. If you actually calculate a market share, uh, we probably be able to. Yeah, you see shop brands. Yeah. So, that's the biggest competition, do sugar or shop brands. 
Um, so I think it's a branded proposition. It's that presence across the segment with you know uh, six to eight uh, sweetener products. And we don't want to go and uh, it's very hard to make sugar in Karnataka and go and sell it in uh, in UP. You get killed on transportation. So I think we have to build a playbook. I think slowly. Yeah. That's the brown sugar. The brown sugar. What I'm trying to say is, we promoted the Tata brand. <laughs> because he's looking up on Tata too. That's right. <laughs> Not yet, not yet, it's only eight. Not yet, it's only eight. Not even a restaurant. Not even a table for dinner. Okay, now we have a live new feedback session. We do this over lunch. I will give you the feedback. I'm sure you will. I'm sure there are many alums here in the Tata group from from IIT. I'm sure you can call on a lot of people. I did not expect this. <laughs> so, So what is a really organic is the <laughs> what is it's a very good question. It's a very tricky question. I'm going to go on the spot. <laughs> so we, we we don't sell organic. We don't sell organic. <laughs> So, so uh, uh, we don't uh, we don't sell organic sweeteners. We do sell organic nutraceuticals. So I, I I will answer your question. Um, yes, I think uh, when you have an organic product on the shelf, there needs to be a certain way it's grown, you know, free of any uh, pesticides or chemicals, so on and so forth, and uh, it commands a premium. Um, you know, the nutraceuticals that we make are all organic. If we sell it, that's not a B two C business. That is a bulk business, and we export most of that. And uh, there's very stringent um, regulations uh, or you know, rules and compliances which we have to follow on the organic side. Um, but to be honest, um, we follow and we follow all of that. And you know, it's uh, it's an investment as well to follow uh, to follow all of that. Uh, an investment in time and resource. Uh, a lot of people. Uh, cut corners and the certifying bodies itself are quite amenable and quite flexible. Excellent. Yeah, uh, to what we present to them. I mean, we make the uh, algae, <laughs> not so algae, we make spirulina and uh, we have strong pairs in that. It's a niche market. There's maybe at scale in India, three or four farms which make spirulina. I mean, you know, I guess Paris Farm would be a got three farms, very large farms. Um, the other guys are quite small. In China, there are about 3,000 farms which make this. So for a certifying body to actually go and certify 3,000 Chinese farms, okay, let's just say 1,000 of them uh, make organic spirulina, they're very flexible in terms of their certification. They give us a very hard time, but they go out and I think they, you know, all of these, uh, all of these guys write them their, write them their checks and then they, it's almost like a business model. So I think organic certification is, uh, is quite freely available, I'm sorry to say, but let me uh, address another point. Um, and, uh, I believe the days of organic are over. I think you're getting into an era of sustainability, you know, uh, transparency, uh, you know, good practices. I mean, uh, we see a lot of brands that we consume in whatever way, clothes that we wear or food that we eat, and you're seeing that already in the West. Uh, that's the narrative that brands have to convey to the consumers, you know, uh, more sustainably produced, cleanly produced with good labor practices, free from chemicals. So it's... Uh, the company making them has good water management practices. It's got a good sort of uh, corporate citizen around the sort of for the society which around which it works. Uh, there's a full broader narrative around transparency, sustainability, circularity. You can put a lot of terms into it. I think a lot of brands are moving towards that sustainable packaging, for example. So I think consumer preference will shift. Um, all of this will command more of a premium in, in my view than say an organic. Food. And I think that shift is happening. Uh, it's happening very, very rapidly. No, it's not. It's not mandatory. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. 
I know a lot of your reduced sugar is perhaps not so good. Yeah. That's why the shift to from used to. Yeah, I think the, the, the different propositions that we offer, right? And you know, we, <laughs> uh, and you know, this is that capability shift. We have a lot of marketers now in uh, who are part of the company who perhaps have FMCG experience. Me kind of being you know, one of them. So um, I think that's the proposition you design. I mean, uh, what we're promising is hygienic, impact, sulfur free, uh, safe. You know, free of any impurities. And that's that's typically a lot, lot of households uh, want. And I think each uh, brand or each sort of product variant that we put in is uh, comes in with a certain with a certain promise. Okay. Sulfur free, generally it's sulfur free. So it'll be a short of that organic culture. Sorry, let me just break his last question. Sure. So I, I think from a uh, from a carry perspective, this is largely a business which I guess uh, works with India as the as the landscape carrying a little bit of exports. But uh, to to the point on value, um, and I think the the strategy that we uh, that we sort of envisage uh, to, to sort of execute or the transformation with the shift and focus more towards uh, biofuels uh, retail, uh, which is the consumer vertical. And the food and nutritional ingredients, uh, we also see it quite attractive from a valuation standpoint. So it's delivering more value. It's a listed company, and currently it trades on sugar valuations, uh, being sort of bedrock of all the companies which value in stock markets. So we see that this shift in strategy, and we haven't spoken enough about it to the to the market yet. Where we're sending signals, but perhaps in more detail, we might take another year or two to cover it. Uh, we feel it be very value of people, so that should generate shareholder returns. Um, but that's probably from a carry perspective. But if you look from a larger group perspective, I guess yeah, uh, different companies are looking at it uh, very differently. Again, if you look at uh, the NBFC space or the insurance space, they are very uh, sort of India focused. They might have technology partnerships which will strengthen their business, uh, for which they will have to look overseas. But if you look at the engineering uh, businesses, uh, I think there there is a much more uh, larger group, uh, global play. Uh, take the example of Kaburandam University, for example. Uh, Forty to forty-five percent of the revenues come from overseas. They uh, just actually made two European acquisitions of a, of a recent size, a reasonable size, just to better their footprint in that market. Uh, there's a lot of innovation around material science and uh, you know, tooling and all of that, which is happening uh, in Europe. Um, they have a very sizable Russian asset. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at, at this time, uh, they are little done in by that. Um, but the sort of strategic call about 15 years ago was to uh, go out and take that asset on because it was the lowest cost silicon carbide producer. I think uh, the Kerala government uh, denied uh, the company a second hydropower project to sort of offset their, uh, you know, uh, fusion expenses. You know, they fuse uh, silicon and uh, to get silicon carbide, so they were denied another power project that actually uh, sort of pushed them to Russia. Uh, and I you know a very successful business was sort of built out of there. So uh, there, I guess, parts of the group where uh, where there is opportunity or where there is uh, opportunity to strengthen the business model, you know, around the supply chain, they have taken uh, taken bets over this as well. Sorry, I'll maybe take one last question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. 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 Or involved in defining uh, what is it efficacy, and I guess I heard the 
the, the nutraceutical industry is also moving in that direction, at least the stronger players and the players who really uh, uh, have a more longer term view on, the, on this space are you know, developing stronger products on the back of uh, very strong science. Nutraceutical science is not as stringent as pharmaceutical science. The clinical trials are 50 people, 100 people, maybe 500 people. It's not, uh, it's not like pharmaceutical trials. Uh, but more, uh, more companies are doing that just to strengthen uh, their proposition uh, and, and bring it into market. See, nutraceutical is not like, it's not like uh, you won't feel better overnight, right? It's, it's consistent uh, consumption. Running a temperature, you take a parasitic the temperature comes down, you feel better. Uh, it's not the same in nutraceutical. Not, nutraceutical is more consistent consumption to you know, maintain a sort of a good steady state. Uh, but I think. Uh, a lot more science is going uh, going into the formulation, going into how propositions are designed, because then ultimately, uh, you know, brands and, and marketers are able to take that messaging forward uh, to, uh, to consumers. So we're seeing uh, more and more of that. We're also seeing more and more of the focus around that sustainable sustainability area that I was talking about around the school because it's very, you know, good growing conditions. Because a lot of these are botanic places or whatever they are. And you know, the uh, the last piece around the nutraceuticals, I think delivery formats are changing. It's not just pills and powders. I think uh, people are delivering them, again, with the science, with the uh, strong and sustainable supply chain. People are trying to deliver them in the form of, you know, food uh, and food and drink in the form of beverages, uh, which are fortified with uh, with these ingredients in the form of the food we eat, your atas are fortified uh, nowadays. Uh, that's perhaps the best way. So in India, I think it's the best way to deliver nutraceuticals. Uh, you don't have a pill popping culture. If they're unwell, we take a, take a medicine. We're not just taking a pill uh, on a daily basis. Some of us who are in the industry, we, uh, we do some of that. But it's generally not that well. So yeah. Fabulous. What is the that this uh, formulation? Oh yeah, yeah, certainly. So I think the, the clinical programs, at least the you know uh, sort of those standard companies that are, they will cover all of this drug drug interaction, how the formulation itself, uh, how the different ingredients interact together. I mean, people will you know it was it was kitchen sink many years ago. People would blend uh, and we've seen this in uh, in uh, we have a nutraceutical company in the US which we now fully own. There was a sort of a scientific technocrat who used to run that business no longer with us, but he used to make kitchen sink formulations and he, he tested on his friends and family and then he would decide he wants to run it. So, you know, all of that is, all of that has changed. Uh, and I think uh, rightly so. Yeah. I think what we're seeing is a, is a more kind of mainstreaming of what was a bit of a cottage. cottage of yeah, yeah. I say, you know, snake oil. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And especially in markets like the US, very very hard to you got to back up. Yeah, yeah, but look, it still it still flies under the radar of the FDA. Your manufacturing facilities have to be uh, you know uh, audited by the FDA. Your products are not under the radar. So well. people uh, and we see that still a lot of lot of guys on Amazon have you know hundred different vitamins uh, and supplements and all of that. They will just uh, they will buy it from the cheapest source and yeah. and resell it. That's their business model. But they may not just be the ones with best model. Okay. Thank you so much. For both joining nice. us, pleasure. For That's the conversation. conversation. <laughs> yes, but also for answering all these questions so patiently. Yeah, yeah. And if I have to say so wisely, uh, with, with you know, this background of philosophy and etiquette that, that <laughs> we have carried through. So yeah. thank you so much. Yes. And probably on behalf of IIT Club, uh, we should give you a round of applause. A big round of applause. <laughs>